Let's go ahead and open in prayer, and then we'll jump into our next lesson in Christology. God in heaven, thank you so much that we have the opportunity to, to read, to ponder, to study, to talk about, not only within a free society, but you've given us the, the tools necessary to be able to do so, not including your word, but also the, the plethora of information compiled by, by great people throughout history that we can study your word with, with efficiency uh, and with exactness. We thank you for that. Help us to be able to take into consideration who you are and, and what Christ, uh, uh, who he was and what he did, uh, how he functioned on this earth, and how we can have confidence, absolute confidence, that Jesus Christ is the one, the Messiah, who lived a perfect life and died for our sins. Uh, help us to be able to, uh, to both... Uh, ponder that, uh, respect it, stand in awe, and most of all, believe it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, we are in Christology. We are, this is part 15 of the child, and we're dealing with the childhood of Jesus. So the last two lessons, um, we've, we, uh, well, Go back three lessons ago. We concluded with the pre-incarnate Christ. That is Christ eternal. That is Christ as the uh, coming into coming in manifest, manifesting towards people in the Old Testament. And we got into last week because it was Christmas, the incarnation. Now, the incarnation is basically the incarnate the coming in the flesh. Incarnate, it's a Latin term, in flesh. And... We first talked about an introduction to that and how it's very important and a lot of stuff that we have to deal with and kind of gave an overview of what we're going to be doing over the next almost year, to be honest with you, depending upon how fast we go through Mark. Um, but then we also, and, uh, at the 11 o'clock hour, dealt with the birth, the, the inauguration of the incarnation, both in the conception of Jesus Christ and also in the birth of Jesus Christ. And now we're going to go over the childhood of Jesus. And, the, er, and the, the early life of Jesus is recorded in Matthew and Luke, not in Mark and John. And when we get to Mark in a couple of weeks, we'll explain why, why all that is, because we have to do that kind of an overview. It's not much. We don't have a ton of details dealing with the childhood of Jesus, but it does give us enough information that we can make some solid uh, theological conclusions and there's information that is necessary, otherwise it wouldn't be there. It's necessary to complete a Christology. You need to understand the childhood of Jesus and what, what, what happened in order to, to understand the, the adulthood of Jesus and why it's still um, understood of who he is and how it completes the, the picture. So that early life of Jesus recorded in Matthew and Luke. It's not much, but it does give some information which is necessary to complete a Christology. So let's turn over first and foremost to Luke. We are going to spend most of our time in Luke. I'll be honest with you. I'm leaving the Magi until next week. I'm going to go past the Magi in time as far as the chronological events, but I, but the Magi is so big and I don't want to skip it. I don't want to, I, I don't want to just fly through it. I want to make sure we give it a proper understanding. And so I'm going to do Luke this week and deal with the childhood of Jesus. Then we'll go back in time a little bit uh -huh, um, and go into Matthew and do the childhood of Jesus in Matthew and deal with it from that point. So Luke chapter 2, starting in verse 21. This is after the birth of Jesus and when he was eight days old. See, we've only moved ahead just a small week. When eight days had passed, before his circumcision, his name was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And so you have a very important concept, first and foremost. Um, eight days after his birth, Jesus was circumcised and given his name. So his name was given, which is, which is the tradition. They wait till eight days later from, from, from point A to point B. I don't know what they call the, the kid. Baby? Babs, you know, perhaps they already know his name and so they already start calling him, but they have a, an official declaration amongst all their friends and family members of what his name is to be. You see this also carried out in Luke when dealing with the birth of John. So that it's typical at the time of a circumcision, he is named. 
And he is named in accordance with the will of God as communicated by a messenger from God, which is a, which is captured in Luke 131, as well as Matthew 121, where the angel told both Mary and Joseph what the child's name would be. You will call his name Jesus. And explains why that is, because he will save his people from their sins. So what does this tell you by his naming? What is happening in the early life of Jesus? Any, any thoughts? Any ideas? Just think about it for a moment. First and foremost, Mary and Joseph are faithful to the command of God as communicated about them by the angel. This is what you're going to do. It came to pass. Mary and Joseph are the primary persons responsible for maintaining Jesus's um, sinless life as an infant. Now, of course, the infant cannot do anything that is sinful or rebellious. The, the, the parents have to do the things that are necessary for Jesus to go forward into kind of that sinless life. Because if he was a, an, an adult male, 30, 30 years old, coming on the scene, and he goes, by the way, I need to get circumcised, there's already a violation. Oh, my, I need to change my name back to Jesus because Mary and Joseph goes, ah, I want his name to be Joseph after, my, after me and my father. Because that's not how you typically name somebody, just a random name that's not part of associated with your family. So if Joseph would have ignored the instruction, he would have to change his name at their, and there's already violation in the, of accordance to God's will, even though he's not the one who did it. Moving on to circumcision. In Scripture, now here it's an important concept because, you know, we've we've moved to, uh, uh, and if you don't know what circumcision is, ask your neighbor. Um, and there's, everyone has a neighbor, so you can do so. Circumcision has become more of a medicinal or a cultural concept in our world. However, to the Jews, even though it was seen as cultural, it is not cultural. It's not something they just do, right? We, when we say it's cultural in our society, it's typical for us to watch sports Sunday afternoon. Almost always, even no matter what season it is, right? If you have an opportunity to watch sports, it's Sunday afternoon, whether it's football, basketball, baseball, or hockey. I love watching the changing seasons. I have a I have a I have a plaque that says that. But circumcision to the Jews was not cultural. It was absolutely 100% religious, if you will. It is a sign of the covenant and mandated under the law. Now it's important to realize, of course, and to remember that Jesus was born under the law. In Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 through 5, in reflection of, of Jesus' life, but when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. Why? So that he might redeem those under the law. Therefore, for Jesus to have no sin, even as a newborn, the law of Moses needed to be followed because he was born under it. If he was not circumcised the eighth day, even if it was not any cause of his own, he didn't rebel. He He's not the one who refused it. His parents just forgot or they didn't want to do it. Then he would have, been, he would have violated the law, even though he was not the one doing it. So once again, for Jesus to have no sin, even as a newborn, the law needed to be followed. And this is the theme that is clearly stated in Luke. Look at verse 39, just kind of as a preview. When they had performed everything according to the law of the Lord. So they did everything that was necessary in accordance with the law and redealing with Jesus as a newborn. I want to kind of go over this idea of circumcision just briefly. Circumcision is part of, and here's the point, circumcision is part of the covenant and the law. And people go, are they the same thing? No, they are not. They are different. There is a distinction between each. First, in the covenant, Jehovah tells Abraham in Genesis. Remember, the law was given in Exodus. In Genesis, there was a, 
uh, a stipulation for people to take part of the, of the of the covenant. So Abraham, so Jehovah tells Abraham in Genesis that every male must be circumcised to partake in the blessing of the covenant. Turn over to Genesis chapter 17. Genesis chapter 17, we'll look at verses 9 through 14. Now, one now is circumcision the covenant? No, circumcision is the sign of the covenant. The covenant is that you will have Jehovah God as your only God. That is the covenant. God said to Abraham, now as for you, this is verse 9, you shall keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. And this is, again, this is a sign. Every male among you shall be circumcised. That's how you are going to identify yourselves as a covenant keepers. Verse 11, and you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be the sign of the covenant between me and you. There it is, the sign of the covenant. And every male among you who is eight days old shall be circumcised throughout your generations. A servant who is born in your house or is brought in with money or any foreigner who is not your descendant, a servant who is born in your house who is brought to you with money, shall surely be circumcised. Thus shall my covenant be in your flesh. For an everlasting covenant. You're making a permanent sign in your flesh that you are people of this covenant. But an uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that person shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. He's basically saying, I'm not, he's, I'm not doing it. I don't, I don't want this with God. And so therefore, he they leave themselves uncircumcised in demonstration that they do not want to partake in that covenant, and they go, he's cut off. It's interesting, and remember, this situation in Genesis 17 is over 400 years before the law. Longer than we've been a country, Abraham was given this instruction of circumcision 400 years before Moses. And how do we know that? In Galatians chapter 3, verse 15, brethren, I speak in human term relations, even though it is only a man's covenant, yet when it is ratified, no one sets it aside or adds conditions to it. Now, the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say it as to seeds, rather to many, but as to one and to your seed, that is Christ. What I am saying is this, the law, which came 430 years later, does not invalidate a covenant previously ratified by God so as to nullify the promise. So the, the, even though the law mentions circumcision again and reemphasizes this, this aspect of it and keeps it in context, of, uh, and it's normally thought of in circumcision of Moses, it is actually circumcision of Abraham given 400 years prior to Moses. It's reiterated, and it's, it's honestly, it's very strange. It's reiterated only in Leviticus 12. On the eighth day of the flesh of his foreskin, on the eighth day, the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised. To which then some history happens after Exodus, right? Exodus happens. They go into the wilderness. Um, they, they, they go up to Kadesh Barnea. They disobey. There's 40 years of discipline. And then Joshua happens. Joshua, in Joshua chapter 5, verse 2, God gives Joshua instructions. At that time, the Lord said to Joshua, make yourselves flint knives and circumcise again the sons of Israel a second time. Now, this does not mean a circumcised male needs to get circumcised again. That's not what it means. That would be weird, and I don't know how that would happen. Take a little too much off the top. Sorry. Um <laughs> So Joshua made flint knives for himself and circumcised the son of Israel at Gilgesh Haraloth. This is the reason why Joshua circumcised them. All the people who came out of Egypt who were males, all the men of war, died in the wilderness along the way after they came out of Egypt. For all the people who came out were circumcised. Now, the, the language here is very interesting. And it's kind of debated on whether or not they were circumcised. Were they circumcising while in Egypt? I don't think so. I think they circumcised as they were leaving 
kind of re redoing the covenant because they were people, they were pagans. They were following after the gods of Egypt. They had this idea of Jehovah God, but they had lost their way being influenced by Egypt. I don't think they were circumcising. And it says that all the people who came out were circumcised as like as they were coming out were circumcised. So it's they were like, but absolutely coming out, all of the males were circumcised appropriately. But all the people who were born in the wilderness along the way as they came out of Egypt were not circumcised. To which I go, why not? And honestly, I think it's because they were not in Israel yet. The circumcision and the covenant, the blessing of the covenant for Israel, specifically deals with entering that land. And so God had them not circumcised while in the wilderness so as to demonstrate circumcision as you go into the land. This is what you're going to maintain when you go in. Fascinating how this is like, you, you kind of see how this works. Because Jesus is not born outside the land. He is born in Israel. So therefore, the eight-day requirement of being circumcised in the land of Israel to maintain that covenant and to maintain being in that location and not cut off out of the land. That's what it means, being dis dispersed out of the land. Jesus had to be circumcised on that eighth day. He could not have waited until he was an adult in order to follow the law of Moses and to and also to keep the covenant of Abraham. So, conclusion on circumcision. As instructed in both the covenant and the law, Jesus was circumcised in Israel on the eighth day. Who is responsible for this? See, one thing, we, we all look at Jesus and say, lived a perfect life, but we don't realize that up to the age of basically his pubescent years, his parents are responsible for maintaining his adherence and also his, his purity when it comes down to uh, the law. His parents were responsible. Uh, God obviously knew what he was doing when he chose Mary and Joseph. Next, Luke chapter 2, verse 22 through 24. Jesus is presented in the temple. And when the days of their purification according to the law of Moses were completed, they brought uh, him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the, the, law of the Lord. Every firstborn male that opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer sacrifice according to what is what is in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now, in this passage, we see that Mary and Joseph were keeping the law and sacrificing to Jehovah for the firstborn male. The word holy in the context. All right. First of all, the word holy in context deals with the idea that the firstborn male is specifically designated out for God. That's the overall main point. Specifically designate. You, that person there, you're going to make a spectacle of that firstborn male because of how he is to be, because it's, and, it's, and I'll go ahead and spoil, uh, give you a spoiler, as a remembrance of something. What is that remembrance? The remembrance is a God, is a, is an understanding of God's blessing and a memorial of the exodus. Recognition is done through sacrifice. If you have your Bibles again, turn over to Exodus chapter 13. Exodus 13, we'll read verses 1 and 2, and then skip down to verse 11. So look how early this is. It's Exodus 13. It's not like Exodus 20, Exodus 25. This is, this is right in dealing with the Passover. Exodus 13, the Lord said to Moses, saying, Sanctify to me every firstborn, the first offspring of every womb among the sons of Israel, both man and beast, it belongs to me. Skip down to verse 11. Now, when the Lord brings you the, to the land of the Canaanites, as he swore to you and to your fathers and gives it to you, you shall devote to the Lord the first offspring of every womb. 
the first offspring of every beast that you own. The males belong to the Lord. I find that interesting. It says when you get to the land, and it took another 40 years. So uh, it, it appears as though there's language here that, that allows for Israel to kind of allow the firstborn beasts to be not sacrificed for while they're in the wilderness. It's, there's questions about that. I don't want to speculate too much. Um, but definitely while you're in the land, you are to consecrate every firstborn. If the, uh, so like if it's a lamb, you sacrifice it. If it's a goat, you sacrifice it. But if it's a donkey, beast of burden, basically, you shall redeem it with a lamb. Why? Because donkeys are more expensive and they're a lot more valuable. You don't get as many. Um, so you, so basically you get a, a donkey, a beast of burden, an ox, and anything like that. Then you're going to redeem that, that beast of burden with a lamb. But if you do not redeem it, if you don't have a lamb, you break its neck. You sacrifice that donkey or that beast of burden. And every firstborn of man among your sons, you shall redeem. You don't, you don't have the choice of going, firstborn male, I don't have a lamb. Oops, I guess I had to break it. You don't have that choice. Now, he gives provisions as to what to do if you're poor. In verse 14, it should come when the son asks you that here's the point. Why are you doing this? Why is this so important? It shall be when your son asks you in time to come saying, what is this? Then you shall say to him, with a powerful hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt from the house of slavery. It came about when Pharaoh was stubborn about letting us go that the Lord killed every firstborn in the land of Egypt, but the firstborn of man and the firstborn of beasts. Therefore, I sacrifice to the Lord the males, the first offspring of every womb, but every firstborn of my sons I redeem. So there's, there is remembrance, there is glory, there is magnification, there is remembrance. This is a memorial to God for what he did to, in order to, to save Israel out of the hand of Egypt. So it shall serve as a sign, for, a sign on your hand and on your faculties, on your forehead, for with a powerful hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt. This is the point. This is why it's done, and it became part of the law. And if you don't do this, you can't be called sinless. If you didn't do it for your son, and he was born, he didn't sacrifice, he is unclean. And, and then sacrifice has to be made in other words. So there's, a, there's an uncleanliness, there's a sinfulness about that particular son if you did not do this. So Mary and Joseph had to perform this sacrifice in order to maintain Jesus Christ's purity. Leviticus chapter 12. This is dealing, so that's done in conjunction with, so there's some two things that are in conjunction, the firstborn male and the law of motherhood. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the sons of Israel saying, when a woman gives birth and bears a male child, then shall she, she shall be unclean for seven days, as in the days of her menstruation she shall be unclean. On the eighth day of her flesh of her foreskin, he shall be circumcised. Then she shall remain in the blood of her purification for 33 days. She shall not touch any consecrated thing nor enter the sanctuary until the days of her purification are completed. Verse 6, when the days of her purification are completed for her son or for her daughter, she shall bring to the priest at the doorway of the tent of meeting a one-year-old lamb. Do you know anything missing from the Luke story? What did she bring? Uh, two, two doves. A one-year-old lamb for burnt offering or a young pigeon or a turtle dove for sin offering. So there's choices there. Why? Then he shall offer it before the Lord and make atonement for her. And she shall be cleansed from the flow of her blood. This is the law for her who bears a child, whether male or female. But if she cannot afford a lamb... See, poor, God doesn't say, well, you know what, too bad for you. If you cannot afford a lamb, then she shall take two turtle doves or two young pigeons, the one for a burnt offering and the other for a sin offering. Everybody can afford a couple small birds. It's a couple pennies. And the priest shall make atonement for her, and she will be clean. So, if the cost of the lamb is too expensive for the family, God has provisions to bring two turtle doves for sacrifice. The sacrifice made in Jerusalem for both Jesus and Mary, 
Okay, they, but that's the same sacrifice. It's in conjunction with the firstborn male sacrifice, as well as the law of motherhood sacrifice. Satisfy the law of Moses for both Jesus and his mother. So you see that the family is remaining very, very dedicated and very righteous and according with the law in order to maintain Jesus's purity as the son of God so that he could not be accused of anything that would be remotely uh, sinful or impure. They couldn't come. The Pharisees couldn't come. Says yes, but you weren't circumcised till you were thirty. Couldn't say that. Why? Because we have record of when he was circumcised according to the history that we have here. You couldn't say you didn't make proper sacrifices. You didn't make the trip to Jerusalem. So it so happens we're only a couple miles away in Bethlehem. The trip is easy. Well, you didn't sacrifice lamb. It's okay. We we're poor. We have a couple turtle doves. A point on timing real quick here. Jesus was circumcised and named eight days after his birth, 33 days after his birth. Okay, so it's not 33 days plus the eight. 33 days after his birth, Joseph and Mary went to Jerusalem to follow the laws and ordinances in regarding to the birth of Jesus. Notice, I want you to notice this. Notice that in text implies that Joseph and Mary could not afford the lamb sacrifice. This is a clue, specifically for me, that demonstrates the Magi had not yet come. Because if they had the gold, frankincense, and myrrh, they're no longer poor. Uh, they're, they're, they're filthy rich in accordance with that land. Okay, And they would have been easily afford a lamb in order for sacrifice. So you have at least a month before the Magi even show up on the scene. Now, I, I, I re-studied it, and I've taught this, I think, even here. Um, but I, I want to make something clear. It is possible that the Magi came soon after the temple visit while they were still in Bethlehem. So the, the assumption is they went to Jerusalem to make sacrifices. I don't think they packed everything up and said, we'll just stop by Jerusalem on the way. They probably went back to Bethlehem, and you still only have a month old, and you still have Mary recovering. Are they going to make the trip to Nazareth at that point? Because the next thing that happens after the temple, um, the temple recognition is they return to Nazareth in verse 39. So my thought is it's possible that the Magi did, in fact, go to Bethlehem while they were preparing to go back to Nazareth. Maybe. And Luke doesn't record it. Uh, there is an interesting concept dealing with the idea of the child in Matthew. In Matthew, it says the Magi came and they saw the child at the house. Well, it makes sense they're at the house. Do you think they remained at the manger scene for like three months? Probably not after the first couple of days, after everyone started going back home after the census. They're probably allowed to go ahead and stay with family. And, you know, they're probably, since Joseph is a worker and he is a carpenter, he can pay for his own way quite simply. Everyone needs a carpenter during those days. So they're probably either... Uh, rented a house or stay with family in Bethlehem as Jesus as Jesus was kind of getting out of that newborn phase and as Mary was healing. So it's possible. I don't know. So I'm I'm, I'm relenting to the fact that the Magi went to Nazareth. I, I I can't definitively say that. And also the fact that the Magi went to the child um, and Pation is used. And I said. That used to be enough information for me that it was a couple years later. However, however, um, Pation is used in Luke 2.17. When they had seen this, they made known the statement which had been made to them about the child. And that's with the shepherds on the first day of his birth. So it's the same word. And so I cannot definitively say that the use of Pation in, in Matthew with the, with the Magi indicates it was a couple years later. So I'm going to say it's at least a month later, possibly up to a couple years later. Back to Luke 2, where we see Jesus being presented in the temple. We have an a, a interesting little discourse here in Luke 2, 25 through 38. We'll read first the, the, the dealing with Simeon. 
in verse uh, in Luke 3. Oh, Luke 3. I ain't close. So let's put it back here. Let's turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 2, verse 25. That's ah, so even when I have my notes. I have Luke 3. Weird. Okay. Oops. And there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout, looking for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came into the, came in the spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child, uh, the child Jesus, to carry out for him the custom of the law. See, they're carrying out for him the custom of the law. He then, then he, Simeon, took him, Jesus, into his arms and blessed God and said, Now, Lord, you are releasing your bondservant to depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. And his father and mother were amazed at the things were being said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rise of many in Israel and for a sign to be opposed and a sword will pierce even your own soul. So even, it's kind of interesting, we'll talk about that in a second. To the end that the thoughts of, for many hearts may be revealed. Let me skip this because that's three. Okay, so Simeon. Simeon was a devout man who was looking for the consolation of Israel. And dealing with the consolation of Israel, it's a very specific word, dealing with uh, the reference to the Messiah. The Messiah would be the one who would reconcile Israel to God. It, Simeon obviously knew if you're looking for reconciliation, what does that mean? There's something wrong with Israel. It's not just that they're under the foot of the Romans. Not just that they've been under the foot of, all, of Gentiles since Daniel. It's that there's something wrong in Israel. And the Holy Spirit directs Simeon into the temple, sees Jesus, snatches him, kind of like a grandmother, <laughs> and blesses God, eulogizes God. That's the word, basically the word bless here is to eulogize. It's to speak a good word about God. The prophecy later on is very interesting. In short, the child Jesus will reveal the problems in Israel. What are we reading about in Matthew? He is exposing all the, the frauds. The Pharisees, they're going, we can't let this guy live. He's exposing us. He's going to re remove our power. So he's, re he's revealing problems in Israel, and there will be turmoil among the people and the religious leaders during the life of Jesus. That's the old, basically the prophecy. This guy is going to shake it up in Israel. But then he's going to be pierced through. It says, even you will be pierced through, meaning he will be pierced through and you will be pierced through. So Jesus would be pierced through, and so will Mary, is basically the, the understanding of verse 35. And we often forget, once again, Joseph and Mary, instrumental in the life of Jesus. We don't know what happened to Joseph. We assume he died before his adulthood. But Mary was there all the way through the ministry of Jesus, even to the point of his death. Imagine, anybody can, can understand how hard it is to watch the Savior die. But what if that Savior came from your own body? Yeah, that, that's a double whammy. And Mary is there at the foot of the cross, watching her son die for the sins of the world. She knew it would happen. Mary, did you know? Absolutely you knew. And I'm sure Jesus told her. I'm sure Jesus prepped her for this. If he prepped his apostles, why not marry with her, with them? And Jesus gave provisions to Mary, his mother, telling John to take care of Mary. In Luke 2, 36 to 38, I, 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 there is a strange woman, a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, the tribe of Asher, she was advanced in years. When the Bible says he's advanced in years, what does that mean? She's old. 
She would live with her husband seven years after her marriage and then, and then a widow to the age of 84. Now, it's possible she lived 84 years after her marriage or she's at 84 years right now. But either way, in Israel, that's old. Right? She never left the temple. Now, when you say never leave the temple, obviously there's going back and forth to your house. But the only thing she did was go to the temple. Serving night and day with fastings and prayers, she was an old, hungry, prayerful woman. I imagine her to be gaunt, thin, just kind of like just always there in the temple, just constantly serving the temple. What is she doing if she's serving in the temple? Is she just there cleaning up? She's a prophetess serving in the temple. What does a prophetess do? She proclaims information. She understands the Hebrew scriptures, and she is also, like Simeon, looking for the consolation of Israel. She understands what's happening. At that very moment, she came up and began giving thanks to God and continued to speak of him, of Jesus Christ, to all those who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. Every, the people that were looking for it, she told them about it. This is, this is basically like the, the, like the shepherds how they were instrumental in the outskirts of Jerusalem. Anna and Simeon were probably about ready to die. I don't know how long Anna lived. She was already old. But she's there in the temple telling people in Jerusalem about what they've seen concerning the person of Jesus Christ. So she was very old, but her ears worked just fine. She goes, who's that? <laughs> just imagine... And you can almost imagine Anna and Simeon, you know, you have both of these advanced age, you know, great grandparents fighting to hold the baby, right? And Simeon's like, I ain't letting go. Anna's like, let me, you know, like, you know, it's just, I can imagine the fight in the temple. She heard Simeon speak and she also began to praise God and she perpetually spoke of the redemption that she just saw. These two individuals did not live to see Jesus die for their sins. And some observations. They were both devout and dedicated to the promises of God. They knew the Hebrew text. They were looking for the Messiah as a child. This, remember, this is dealing with Christ incarnate. This is dealing with in the flesh. They didn't go out to the outsiders. They weren't looking up at the sky waiting for the Messiah to come in a cloud. They were looking for a child. One that would be born as this Messiah. They understood Jesus coming in the flesh should not have been a surprise to people who were looking for it. They had the timing down. Remember the timing that was established in Daniel. That you have a certain amount of days from the erection of the temple and the building of the walls of Jerusalem until, until the Messiah would be on the scene. So they were looking. They don't know the exact date, but they knew this. It's about now. He should be here about now. Let's keep on looking for him until he appears. They knew, and I find this interesting, why were they in the temple? In order to follow the law, the baby had to come to the temple. They didn't have to go look for him. He will come to me. And finally, they spoke the truth in Jerusalem to all who would hear. How many would hear? Very few. Especially in Jerusalem, under the thumb of the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Sanhedrin. To conclude, <clears throat> in, Matt, in Luke 2, 39 uh, through 52, basically, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of make a, a summarization of this. Um, they return to Matt Nazareth. Um, but one thing that's very interesting here Again, is this after the after the after the Magi before the Magi? <coughs> Unimportant. Okay. But I will say this: verse forty is, is huge. The infant returned to Nazareth, and he continued to become strong. The child continued to grow and become strong, increasing. Now, the strength is not in physical form. That's not what Luke is talking about. To grow and become strong is a mental an issue, mental understanding. As Jesus grew physically, he grew in awareness and knowledge and wisdom.
How do we know that he grew an awareness of who he is? Well, I believe that is exactly why Luke includes verse 41 through 52. What do you mean he grew an awareness? In other words, he didn't grow up going, I, I'm just a kid in Nazareth, hanging out, partying with my friends. He knew exactly who he was at a very young age. And he grew in knowledge and wisdom. As his parents taught him the Bible, he understood it. His wisdom was beyond all men. How do we know? Let's conclude by reading this. Now, his parents went to Jerusalem every year, the Feast of Passover, following the law, keeping him pure. And when he became about 12, they went up there according to the custom of the feast. And they were returning after spending a full number of days. The boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but his parents were unaware of it, but supposed that he was with the caravan. He's 12 years old. 12 years old are not like our 12-year-olds. 12-year-olds are basically men. Okay, they're they're responsible for themselves. However, they're still under the authority of their of his parents. And they began looking for him amongst the relatives and acquaintances, and they did not find him. They returned to Jerusalem looking for him. Then after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers when they saw him. They were astonished, and his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us this way? Behold, your father and I have been anxiously looking for you. And he said to them, Why is it that you were looking for me? Did you not know that I had been in my father's house? But they did not understand the statement which he had made to them. Uh, it, it almost appears, though, even though they're keeping him pure, they've kind of like almost forgotten who Jesus is. Like, what? Well, what do you mean your father's house? Your father's right here. Oh. And he went down with them and came to them to Nazareth, and he continued in subjection to them. And his mother treasured all these things. And Jesus kept increasing in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. In other words, all of these things happened for a reason. All of these things are recorded for a reason. His parents were devout in the law. Throughout his youth, until it's his responsibility to take it on. And Jesus was aware of his nature and his responsibility. However, he did not compromise the authority of his parents. He was fully understanding exactly who he was, even at the age of 12. Now, is that when he became aware? Probably not. Um, I find it very interesting the entire account of Jesus as a youth, because it makes one particular point. Jesus was sinless, even in his youth. Following the law, in respect of his father, his father, father, as well as Joseph and Mary. Fascinating. Next week, we'll do Matthew and deal with the Magi and how Matthew treats the youth of Jesus. Let's pray. God in heaven, thank you for your word that we can see and compare and contrast uh, your history, that we can understand who you are better, therefore have a better understanding to present to you to those who need to hear. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.